And now for our second reading, an epistle, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes, when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. The word of the Lord. So as you see, the message title is called Entrusting Our Souls, Entrust Our Souls. And you may have noticed that I'm doing things slightly different today. I'm trusting in God that that's going to be okay. I wanted you to hear the Mark reading and the Peter reading before the message. Because Peter is the one who gets rebuked in the gospel for setting his eyes on the things of man, for putting his own desires ahead of God's will. we got a painting of that. There's Jesus saying, get behind me, Satan, as you heard in the earlier reading. It's not focusing on the things of God. Not on God's will, not God's kingdom, but his own desires about Christ, about his relationship, about his discipleship, about his walk. But then it is the Spirit through Peter's hand who writes this letter that we read from. And it's to the elect that are in exile, the exiles. And so this is after Peter denies Jesus, after Christ's death, after the resurrection, after the ascension, and as an apostle with the keys to the kingdom in his hand, he writes this letter. And so we can see how Peter has grown just by reading this. And hopefully you too can see your own growth in your life. Maybe 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 2 years ago, yesterday you thought something. And God changed your heart. God rebuked you. God led you to a place. God showed you something. And you are stronger for it. You're better for it today. And that's Peter here. But then it's also the Spirit speaking to the elect exiles about trust. About trust in the Lord. And trust isn't something that's built in good times. Trust isn't something that's built on an easy day. Trust isn't something built easily at all. Trust is shown during tough times. Trust in the Lord is shown when we're going through issues, when we're going through trial, when we're going through tribulation. That's where we show our trust. It's very easy to show trust. In fact, it's a very shallow trust on a good day, when things are going your way. But to have faith in the Lord, to trust in Him, when they're not. That's what Peter is speaking to here. That's what the Spirit is saying. And so before my walk with Christ, I'll admit, I put my trust in people, in things, in organizations, friends, family, co-workers. And that trust was never tested. You know, I was, it would always be easier. It would be like, oh yeah, how you doing? Or, yeah, I trust that that organization is doing the right thing. It was never tested. Until it was. And to my surprise, I was putting my trust in the wrong places. In the wrong people. And boy, is that a strange feeling. 
All of a sudden, things you thought you knew, people you thought you knew, the way certain things worked is alien. It's foreign to you. But now, I have learned better. Like Peter, coming along in his journey, like you all have. I know exactly who to place wholly my trust into. To keep my soul. To give us the truth. To convict us when we need to hear it. To pray for us when we need prayers. I know who that is. And so let us, when we go through this scripture, hear the truth out of the one who trusts in God. And so 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19 starts off, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. So what, the Spirit is tell- what is the Spirit telling us here? Don't be surprised when trial and tribulation come. It's going to happen. Some of you may think, oh, well, I won't be there. I'll be called up. Be raptured away. God will call me away before I have to go through any real trial or tribulation. Maybe. Maybe you are like the church in Philadelphia, one out of seven, who doesn't have to go through any further trial or tribulation. But if you aren't called up, don't be surprised. The church in Smyrna, in Revelation 2.10, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. So the word is telling us right away, yes, you can go through easy times, and some of you may. But for most, don't be surprised when the trial comes. Don't be, wow, I'm in a strange place. I didn't know this would happen. I hope that's not the case, because you can walk out the door today and go, nope, Pastor Joe read that thing. This is going to happen. This is not strange. This is in God's will. (laughs) Instead, when trial, when persecution happens, do not fear what you're about to suffer. And then 1 Peter 4, 13 goes on, but rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Wow. Surprised, strange, afraid, and we're being told to rejoice. That seems counterintuitive, but with God it always is. Because our flesh nature, our anxiety, our desire, our sinfulness will constantly lead us in the wrong way. But when we are being persecuted, when something is going wrong, we should be looking towards the Lord. We should be like, how are we glorifying him? How wonderful and joyous is it that we are here as servants? Acts 5, so they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonest, dishonor for the name, for Christ. Some real-world, practical today examples of this going on. This is a Canadian preacher, um, Arthur Pawlowski. I think I got that right. He's a pastor, and he chased out the police for trying to close his church while he was preaching. He's been arrested on a few accounts because they're getting a little, well, anti-religious up there in Canada right now. But do you think he's ashamed to be dragged off by the police for preaching the word of the Lord? For being arrested as he's leaving church? To pray with people in public? No, he's not ashamed. He's rejoicing. The handcuffs might be tight, but he is rejoicing. And so how, how maybe does this affect us? Or is there another example? Well, yes. This, I, I'm so, this, talk about strange. I picked out these scriptures. I emailed John and Margaret. I said, this is what we're doing this week. And then two days later, on January 17th, Jim Jordan releases this letter detailing government agencies flagging 
American citizens, tracking them, making a list about them. They're on this list if they wrote anything or had a transaction about MAGA or Trump, Bass Pro Shops, Dick's, sporting goods stores, anywhere that they think that there is something insidious, insidious about you know, conservatism. Well, you know what, just anybody the government doesn't like, they were trying to put on this list. And this also included religious texts, specifically the Bible. And to my surprise, as I'm reading this, an Amazon box of four Bibles is sitting on my, <laughs> sitting on my dining room table. And I go, well, I'm definitely on that list. <laughs> but I wasn't scared. I didn't have anxiety about it. If I'm going to end up on a government list, if I'm going to end up persecuted, if I'm going to end up anything, I would rather be that for God. If I'm thrown into prison, beaten, stoned, crucified by any group, any person, any government, there is only one thing on that list of sporting goods stores, of political affiliation that glorifies God. And it's not Bass Pro Shop. I will rejoice if it is all over the word. So the Spirit is saying, don't be surprised and confused that things like this happen. They're going to happen. Different scales, different ways, different times in your life. Don't be surprised, don't be confused, but rather rejoice. Rejoice that you're a servant of the Lord. Rejoice that you're counted worthy to suffer dishonor for his name. And these fiery trials can take all different shapes and sizes. Peter goes on, softens from the fiery trial to just being insulted. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. That can be from inviting someone to church. You know, them scoffing at you. Be from praying in public with somebody. Getting darts from eyes across the room. Jokes told. Any insults. But you see, if you're willing to be thrown into prison, beaten, stoned, crucified, if you're willing to give up your flesh, all that's left for the enemy to do is to attack you on the inside, to attack your heart, to attack your mind. Because the only way you would be hurt is character destruction, false accusations, deception. And so don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. Don't let it hurt your feelings. Don't let it cause fears. Don't let it cause anxieties. Put your trust and your faith in the Lord to see you through that. And your trust in Him brings His Spirit upon you. Gives you the strength. Gives you the fruits of the Spirit. The endurance. The long-suffering. The kindness. The patience. Everything you need to withstand the enemy. The trial the insults, whatever it is that be in front of you. But then let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler, he says in verse 15. Don't go into suffering. Don't choose to suffer for anything that is unrighteous, that will not glorify God. And as I said, it's not Bass Pro Shops. It's not uh, support of MAGA. It's the word. It's Christ's name. That's why you go into suffering. That's the only thing that glorifies God. Now, if you go and you murder somebody, that isn't going to glorify him. If you steal, if you covet, that isn't going to glorify him. And if you do a laundry list of evil that this sinful and wicked generation has generated and we all get to see on our phones and the internet and the news constantly... That does not glorify God. But not being ashamed of him, not being ashamed of his word, that's what brings him glory. Now, of course, and so here we go. Don't be ashamed of God's word. Pick up your cross and carry it. Follow Christ and don't try to please others, including yourself. 
Now, of course, someone can frame you for murder. They can accuse you of stealing. They can call you an evildoer for any number of reasons. Yes? But this is suffering in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of a state, of the state or group or another person or the accuser that's attacking you. God knows your heart. God knows if you didn't or did not do that. And so don't even be ashamed when false accusation comes at you. Because if you are falsely accused because of Christ, because of the word, you are blessed. And if anyone suffers as a Christian, Paul in prison here, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. I like this one because he's preaching inside of prison. He's talking to somebody inside of prison. Even in chains, he can still glorify God. And that's the good kind of trouble. Maybe you heard me say that before. The good kind of trouble. It's when you're in trouble with man or humanity or the state, but you're right with God. I get in that kind of trouble all the time at seminary. I get in trouble for not allowing or praying for or following along with something that I know to be sinful, even though that will get me in trouble. Even though I have to take a lower grade or not participate in a field trip. But that's easy. That's not prison. That's not shackles. That's just insults. And we should all be willing to do that. To glorify God in that way. And that's the good kind of trouble. The good kind of trouble is suffering for Christ. That's the trouble we can glorify God with. And we are not ashamed to do it. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Christ believes in us. He's, he's given us all we need. He's given us, He's made it so the Holy Spirit was poured on us, he's given us the word. God has helped us every step of the way. He has delivered for us. And all he asks in return is trust in him, belief in him, and not to be ashamed of him. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And this is our encouragement. This is our promise. This is where our trust, this is where our faith comes in. God will judge. He will judge the persecuted, the imprisoned, the slain, the obedient ones. And how will he judge them? Again, I'm going to reread Revelation 2.10, but I'm going to continue going. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. But be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. There's not really even many good images of that. This is the best one I could find. Christ anointing somebody with a crown. Those who suffer for Christ and trust in the Lord will receive the crown of life. And maybe that's an insult. Maybe that's a beating. Maybe that's imprisonment. Defamation of character. Loss of friends. Loss of family. Loss of job. But it's for him. It's the only thing that it's worth losing over is for him because he is the provider of everything. And how about those who do not obey the gospel of God? If the righteous is scarcely saved... And this is what our bulletin cover is. Job, in full desolation, in full destruction, everything taken away from him. If the, if the righteous go through that, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Job was a righteous man. The devil put through a trial. Took away his wealth, his land, his riches. His, I'm sorry, I said riches twice. His family, his sons, his daughters, his wife took away his health, took away everything. Complete and utter desolation. And that's what happens to the righteous. 
That's what can happen to us. That's what we can go through. The ringer. But what will become of the ungodly and the sinner if that's what Christ, if that's what the apostles, if that's what the saints, if that's what the prophets, if that's what Job went through? Well, we know what that end looks like. It is the lake of fire. It is torment. It is separation from the Father in eternity. And therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And so therefore, Peter's conclusion, what the Spirit is saying through Peter's hand, says, we will suffer at the hands of evil. And it is according to the word. And if you don't think I'm true or if I'm misreading the scriptures, I can point to a very specific example where somebody who is good and righteous and holy suffered the evil and didn't do it, suffer it for his own sake, but for the sake of others. And that is Christ on the cross. Christ suffered and died for us according to God's will. He took that cup. But we trust in the Lord, not for an easy earthly existence. We trust our souls to our faithful and eternal God. In Psalm 53, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? So church, there are many ways the enemy can try to test you, to destroy you, to put you on trial, to make life uncomfortable, to make you shameful, to twist you, to turn you. Just like Job here. But when that fiery trial comes, the Spirit tells us, helps us to remember not to be surprised when the word of God becomes illegal. Not to be confused when your neighbor turns you in for preaching the gospel. But rather, let us rejoice when the enemy breaks down your door. Defamed and accused for the word, rejoice. In handcuffs for Christ, rejoice. With bruises and cuts, rejoice. Tortured and secluded, rejoice. Murdered for the glory of God. Rejoice. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Rejoice because you endure all of that hideousness for the glory of God. And you can endure it all. You can endure it because you are in Christ, and Christ is in you. And like Christ, we have full obedience to the Father. We can drink that cup when he asks us to. And by doing so, we entrust our souls to him. Let us now go to prayer.